Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Tony Round, and I'm the Director of Business Development for the Association of Proposal Management Professionals, APMP. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to another edition of APMP's sponsored webinar series. Today's presentation from Chorus is Setting Up Content and Pursuit Libraries in Microsoft Teams. Our typical webinars are free to APMP members as a benefit of their membership, and we do our best to keep them vendor agnostic. Or in other words, we want our webinars to offer takeaways that you could begin implementing immediately without having to solicit any particular services or products. We've learned over time that many of our topics do deal with technology solutions, and a fair number of our members are clamoring for more information about the products and services themselves. So while APMP remains vendor neutral, we want to offer options where a vendor can produce a presentation for you with no restrictions to the content they provide. These sponsored webinars might include product demos, best practices that you might be able to utilize with other products, but maybe things that only the vendor's software can do, and so on. As always, you'll receive a survey afterwards, and please let us know your thoughts about every aspect of this experience. Was it clear to you what you were going to see? Was it valuable to you? What advice do you have for the vendor, etc.? We do share your comments with the presenters. And before I turn over to our presenters, know that today's session is being recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed to all registrants a few hours after the presentation is over. As you think of questions throughout today's session, I encourage you to check out the GoToWebinar control panel where you'll find the questions pane. You can type your questions there at any time during the presentation and we will do our best to address them later in the webinar. All right, I think we're ready to go now. So I'll turn things over to today's presenter, Ray Meary. Go ahead, Ray. Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, welcome everybody to the Chorus and APMP collaboration today. Uh, we're going to focus on setting up content and pursuit libraries in Microsoft Teams. Uh, my name is Ray Mehring. I'm the CEO of Chorus Software, and it's really nice to meet everybody virtually today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to attend or to watch on demand. We do know that you have many choices in how you spend your time, and we're grateful to have you here today. We certainly hope that the content that will be presented will help you as you think through uh, the new work reality, but also think about your future work as well. Um, let's get started with uh, an introduction to our panelists today. Um, let's start with uh, Glenn and then Olivia. If you could introduce yourselves just so that we know who's talking today. Yeah, hi, my name is Glenn Pankhurst. I'm a strategic customer success manager here at Chorus. And I've been with the company since around 2013, and I'm currently based in Seattle, Washington. Thanks, Glenn. Hi, hi. I'm Olivia Hardy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I've been working with Chorus for quite a long time now, and I've got my own consulting company, Catalytic Consulting. Um, I've worked on a lot of proposal management um, implementations, and I'm a proposal writer myself. Very good. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, in this discussion today. Uh, just as a quick intro, at, at Chorus, we work very closely with bid proposal and sales teams around the world. And they often ask us for assistance and help when it comes to building out targeted and engaging proposals. Uh, they want to make sure that the bid managers, business development managers, subject matter experts can quickly locate the content that they need and then use that content efficiently as you, as you collaborate on documents. Now, with that background in mind, what we're hoping to bring you today as part of this program is some insights into how the combination of Microsoft Teams and its collaboration capabilities can work with proposal technologies and how this can really give you a lot of gains in terms of your, uh, your productivity and your efficiency. We'll be focused around four points uh, during today's webinar that will uh, handle uh, some of the pains that are experienced uh, by teams today. And really gonna focus on uh, building up a single uh, center of excellence that can be represented in a content library or in a pursuit library, and then showing you how those things can facilitate you to find content, access content, search for that content, and manage the content as well. Um, so this combination of proposal management systems and Microsoft Teams uh, will help you to get started. And, and really all you need is a Microsoft Office 365 subscription and uh, everything that we're gonna show you today 
will be possible or could be replicated based on that. So let's get started then with our panelists. Uh, we're going to look at the first challenge, an unpredictable workload. Olivia, let's focus this question on you. The life of a proposal writer uh, really seems to be driven very often by the whims of others. Uh, and it's hard to plan your day or the tasks in your week. Can you tell us a little bit more about that specific challenge? Absolutely. So even with a careful capture plan, you just really don't have any control over when RFPs might land on your desk. And the reality is that no one wants to turn down an RFP if you're capable of winning the business um, because you're too busy. So what happens is during the peaks, you can have RFPs flowing in fast and furiously and it feels like you need a small army of people to just not just manage the workload, but also do a good job of it and win the deals. Um, but then you might also have some equally quiet periods in between and those are quite difficult to forecast. So what ends up happening is that proposal teams tend to be quite small relative to the sales organizations that they support. And it's often hard to justify increasing your proposal stock because of these quiet periods, there just isn't enough to justify being on the payroll all year round. Um, so what also ends up happening is that a lot of people in proposal writing end up wearing many hats and finding themselves in different roles so that they, their capacity is better utilized, which is fine in the quiet times, but those hats don't necessarily go away when the RFPs are coming in. Um, and so that puts additional strain on the team. So I think that's why it's important that proposal teams are able to scale their capacity quite rapidly without sacrificing quality. And there's really no time to figure it out when the RFPs are coming in, you kind of need to make a plan before that beforehand. So, and be prepared with the right processes, content, technology, um, like good content libraries, templates, and good workspaces where people can collaborate with you. Yeah, that's uh, those great points there, Olivia. And certainly we've seen those challenges in many bid and proposal teams uh, around the world. Now, you've mentioned content libraries, templates, work workspaces. Uh, let's really drill into that. Maybe, Glenn, we can hand over to you to talk about those particular subjects. Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing to cover is what is the content library and what's the benefit of everything, having everything in one place. So a content library, for those that don't know, is a centralized repository for reusable content that is maintained over time. The content will then be made available as a trusted source for the teams that need to make use of it. So speaking of Microsoft Teams, um, it's a great tool which allows you to extend and add more value to your content library. So Teams is essentially a hub for team collaboration inside of Office 365, but it's also a communications platform that offers file storage, chat, video conferencing, and more. So it really extends uh, what you can do with the native content library and adds all this additional functionality and features to it. Um, but now let's have a quick look at how to set up your content library within Microsoft Teams. So first you would click on the join create button at the bottom left of Teams. Then you would choose to create your team from scratch. And then what you don't see here is you provide a name and you would say whether the team was public or private and add your team members. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, once your team has been created, you can then start to build your folder, subfolder, and your file structures. All right now, if you have an existing content library on your own computer or a network share, you can literally just drag and drop that entire thing with the folder structures and files into Microsoft Teams, and it will be replicated in its entirety. And it's pretty much a bulk upload. So it's really easy to get your content into uh, Teams for the content database portion. Thanks, Glenn. That, uh, that's very practical and that looks pretty easy to be able to get started just setting up that team and getting your content in there. And I guess the key is to build as you go then. Um, you don't have to aim for a perfect library right at the start, but you can uh, progressively build out that library uh, with your content. Olivia, we'll switch back to you. Let's talk about the next uh, challenge um, that uh, comes up for, for teams. Um, past proposals don't have all the answers, and at times they can be inefficient and even dangerous. Talk to us about that challenge, please. 
Indeed. So in the absence of a well-stocked library of answers, what ends up happening is that, um, especially new teams as you're just getting started, is you turn to past proposals to, get, to dig out an old answer to a similar question. Um, and there's several problems with that. So firstly, you need to remember which proposal contained which answer and potentially go through multiple past proposals until you find the one you're looking for. And then when you've got it, it takes forever to sit through a very long proposal document to find just one answer. And that answer might not be the best answer. It could be out of date. Um, and then that's where the dangerous part comes in. It could also contain information about another prospective customer because it's not written for the prospect you're currently dealing with it's for past situation so you definitely don't want to inadvertently include information about any other customer in your bid response um, that will kill the deal for sure um, but when what you will want to do instead is take your past proposals genericize them so they don't contain any past customer information and then mine them and break them up into reusable answers or proposal parts to whom you can assign experts to review for you from time to time. And if you have to just pick one lesson today out of this whole webinar, I would say focus on developing a single source of truth for your content. It's a low hanging fruit that will yield the best return in terms of savings and quality, and it will be really key in helping you scale. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you for making that suggestion, Olivia, and also highlighting some of those dangers that can come with uh, just reusing uh, answers out of a past proposal. Now, obviously, uh, and something you've mentioned is that personalization, differentiation, uh, focusing on business value, these are really keys to uh, having a winning proposal. So it, it makes a lot of sense then that reusing old content isn't necessarily going to, uh, to to work out uh, for the best uh, as you're building out your next one. All right, Glenn, let's turn it back to the Microsoft Teams conversation now. Uh, show us in a bit more detail how we can customize that Teams library so that that really becomes the powerhouse behind your proposal team. Sure, so once you've uploaded your content, and again, as to raise point earlier, you don't have to build the entire house first. You know, sometimes you build iteratively. Um, but there are things that can help you facilitate that. And that's where Teams is really powerful and great. So um, you can add additional functionality very easily to Teams. Um, there's a, a option at the top right where you add a tab and you can choose from a list of recommended applications for you to use, which you may or may not recognize. Um, most of them are well known, but if you want to dig in for something that you, you use that is not listed as recommended, you can click on the more apps option and browse through the entire list and find something more relevant to your use case that will suit your use case. And one of these apps that I would personally suggest is Microsoft Planner. Uh, you go to the next slide. So within this app, you can customize your view with columns. Um, let's call them process markers like to do, in progress, and completed. This really helps you to track and manage your workflows, schedule meetings, assign tasks and deadlines to team members. Um, other great apps that I like are Microsoft Stream and OneNote. Yeah, that's that's very cool. And there's a lot of new apps uh, coming out. Microsoft's clearly iterating on the Microsoft Teams product quite a lot. So exciting new opportunities there. Um, I didn't realize that some of these things were actually available directly inside uh, Teams. So adding those process components, as you mentioned there, will be a, a great help for virtual teams as they get uh, they get started with their, their proposals there. All right, thank you, Glenn. That, that's uh, uh, some great suggestions there. Back to you, Olivia. Pain point number three. Would you like to talk us through that third pain point? Yes, so collaborating with SMEs can be taxing. Um, so the thing to remember with our subject matter experts that we rely upon and we need to get answers for particular bids is that they all have day jobs, um, they have other responsibilities, they don't like being asked the same question over and over again, uh, they don't li like to have to log into yet another system to respond to you. So in the absence of a proper collaboration strategy, I think everyone's known this at one point in time, it's email chaos. Uh, with threads that are impossible to follow and that take a ridiculous amount of time to put together. And that's 
even if they respond. Um, chasing sneeze can be a bit like herding cats. No one likes to nag and send one friendly reminder after another. So the solution then is to make it as easy as possible for SMEs to work with you. And one way to do that is to adopt technology that already fits in their day-to-day -day work, which is why Teams actually work so well for this. Um, and you don't want to bother your SMEs unnecessarily. So if you are documenting the answers that you receive from them and you are putting them back into your knowledge libraries, so you've got it in time for the next RFP, you're going to be saving yourself and your SMEs a lot of time and potentially a lot of frustration. Thanks, Olivia. And having been a subject matter expert on one of your uh, proposals and RFP responses before, I know that uh, it can be a taxing process. So you, you're definitely right. But isn't this a, a great opportunity inside of Microsoft Teams to be able to implement something that Chorus calls a pursuits library? Uh, it's the type of library that helps when you're working and collaborating as a team. So you can get all stakeholders into, into one place, into, into one team to be able to collaborate on those documents and to be able to, to share ideas. Uh, Glenn, it would be a good time for us to ask you to actually show us one, what one of those libraries looks like uh, in the PowerPoint slides. Sure, so creating a pursuits library is quite a lot like creating a content library, but where the difference is, is the structures do differ quite a bit based on what, you, what you're trying to achieve. So let's have a look at that in more detail. So within the Teams, uh, uh, sorry, within the team pursuit library, you can create channels or let's call them subsections in your team and you can name them after each client or type of pursuit. So each engagement you do for your customer, you wanna create a place for that, All right? And then once you've also created those structures, you can then add tabs to the navigation bar just in the same way you could with the content library. Um, but you may want to make use of different applications in this instance. Yeah. There is also an existing file tab where you can upload your existing files, maybe the customer's RFP that you're going to respond to, or maybe you have some folder structures and some files that you always include in your response. So you can do the same thing with the structures and files, and you can collaborate and co-author within there as well. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you can add apps to help manage your to-dos, your meetings, your recordings, your notes, and you can assign or delegate tasks to your team members as well, or even your subject matter experts, as Olivia was stating. Um, you can also integrate uh, directly with Dynamics 365, and you can add a reporting tab, which will eventually integrate with Chorus Content Hub's proposal technology. Awesome, Glenn. Uh, so that would mean that we've got a content library for our reusable content stored in Microsoft Teams, and we've got a pursuits library for each of the uh, uh, bids that we're involved in also in Microsoft uh, Teams. Um, and we wanted to take some time to show you how technology like proposal management software can connect these libraries uh, with the user. But before we do that, let's move on to our uh, fourth challenge there. Challenge number four is uh, how about the time spent formatting and personalizing? We know this is a really big requirement, specifically the formatting of, of documents and has become even more prevalent uh, since COVID started. Um, so Olivia, uh, talk us through that challenge, please. Absolutely. So we touched on personalization a little bit earlier and how important it is to be customer focused. In fact, there's even research from Forrester that found that 85% of decision makers um, agree that they that buyers will dismiss a seller in the first interaction if they don't receive tailored information. So hopefully the RFP is not your first interaction, but it just goes to show how important uh, that customer focus is. And the problem is that personalization can really take hours if you don't have the right tools for the job, and applying branding consistently throughout and, and quickly because you're altering the text, I mean, it, needs, it needs to be something that you've got the, the right tools at your fingertips to do. Um, and so if you're able to shape and design your reusable content in such a way that you can automate some of these very time consuming tasks, it can really be a huge time saver. Right, and, and that's where proposal uh, management software really comes into the picture. I'm sure many on the audience, uh, in the audience today already use 
proposal management tools. But uh, if you aren't using a tool, it's a good time to consider how to do that because it pulls together these elements and then adds on top of that capabilities like search, creation, collaboration, and, and tracking as well. Now, uh, Glenn, if we've taken the time to build the content library and the pursuit uh, library in Microsoft Teams, how can we get them connected to proposal management software? Uh, can you show us that? Sure, that's a great question where Chorus comes in. So within Chorus, you can add what we call a connection or a SharePoint connector to your content library in SharePoint. And at the same time, you can add another connection or a Microsoft Teams connector to your Teams in um, for your Pursuit library. So that way you can uh, marry those two together and allow the users to utilize that content in your content library within your Pursuits using the Office add-ins. Um, and they can do that all natively through Office itself. Very good. Does that answer so your question, right? No, so you'll use your Office applications then to be able to connect in and, and pull that content uh, from the libraries in while you're responding to, to bids uh, directly there. Uh, Glenn, uh, is everything replicated into Teams afterwards? That's also a great question. So yes, anything you do within Teams will show up in Chorus. Anything you do within Chorus will also show up in Teams. So those two do natively talk to each other. Very nice. Well, we thank you very much uh, for, for those comments, uh, Olivia and Glenn, and for taking us through uh, some of those uh, screenshots there as well. Um, Microsoft Teams has certainly become a very popular tool inside of proposal and bid teams, and uh, to such an extent that we actually took the time to write a book um, on how we can build con content and pursuit libraries in teams. The details there are on your screen in that uh, bit.ly um, url there so feel free to go ahead and download that document there and you can see some of the practical things that glenn's been talking through and really a step-by-step -step guide on how you might set up those libraries and uh, those uh, connectors inside of microsoft teams well tony it would be good to hand it back to you and uh, see if we've got any questions for the from the audience that we can cover Yes, and thanks very much for that, Ray, and the, the team. I, did, you have got some kudos, particularly for Olivia. You speak the truth, apparently, very relatable. <laughs> so I think some of our uh, some of our viewers can relate to some of the challenges you've been facing. Um, there have been a good few questions here, so if you'll bear with me, I'll run through some of these. Um, not being technical myself and not familiar with some of these programs, you will appreciate that I'm, barely, I'm basically reading what I see, not necessarily understanding what I say. Um, so, a message from Christian asking, um, is there a way to use Teams as an extension of an existing SharePoint library? I don't know if that's one for Glenn or whoever would like to answer that one. Yeah. So, you can actually create a team from an um, existing structure. Um, and you know, what you need to also remember is that behind Teams is SharePoint. So, Teams is a great user interface that hides the fact that SharePoint is behind or under the hood. But it is a SharePoint site. It has the libraries and it has all the files. So you can utilize that for creating a team. Excellent. I hope that okay, answers everyone. your question. Okay, well, hopefully that's enough for you, Christian, on that point. So uh, another question here from Melissa. Uh, what about when one would use Adobe InDesign, which requires a links folder to be linked to the main InDesign file uninterrupted? Can you give any advice on that? Any any thoughts on that, Glenn or Olivia, on that particular one with InDesign? We have actually worked with a number of clients that uh, that like using InDesign. Um, do you have any tips on the Teams aspect of that? Okay, I so don't from, from within. But it might be worth looking at connectors. Sorry, Glenn, go ahead. No, no, no. You you carry on. You started before me. Yeah, I was going to say that the, I know that there are um, a bunch of connectors inside of Teams for Adobe Creative Cloud. I'm not sure about InDesign specifically, but it might be worth having a look at. And as I we was saying earlier, there's a lot of development going around that and they're becoming more and more integrated. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is something, but would have to be researched. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Glenn? Sorry, say it again. I said, is there anything to add to that? 
No, so Olivia is correct. So you would look at what applications are currently supported, which is evolving all the time with Microsoft. Um, I don't personally know whether there's a native one already created for InDesign, but it's really good ideas to have a look at the Teams boards to see if it's in the pipe or it's coming up or if it's already an app in the ecosystem. Okay, thanks very much, guys. All right, next question from Lee Ann. Um, are documents and images able to be tagged for search capability? I'll take that one. So what, what we didn't show you uh, within Teams, because it, it's a simple user interface on top of SharePoint, right? But behind the scenes, there is SharePoint, and therefore you get all of those powerful features that you are alluding to, which is tagging, right? So when you've tagged files, and it doesn't matter what file it is, it could be a zip file, could be an image, it could, it's irrelevant, it's, it's a file. You can tag it with what we call metadata, and Chorus will read that and will surface it up as a filter if it's been set up in the correct way, which is referenced in the user guide that um, you can download as part of this webinar. So we've gone through quite a bit of detail in there in terms of setting up teams uh, simply, and then going a little bit further to add those tags and that metadata and how to surface that up in Chorus, which is then going to allow you to find that content more easily and more in a more controlled manner. So I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Thanks very much, Glenn. And this this looks like it's developing into an Ask Glenn session at the end of this. So oh, um, um, there's one, there's one more thing I just want to make clear. So the 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 guide that is part of this webinar is the Teams guide. It's much lighter on things like tags, like the last question. That's in our SharePoint guide, which you can find through our website, chorusdocs.com. Uh, so there's okay. two different guides. The SharePoint guide is, is a little bit more technical. If you want to do those sort of things, you don't have to. And the Teams guide is a little bit lighter if you'd prefer to stay at that level. They both have their benefits. So you, you need to choose okay. which is going to be better for your use case. All right, excellent. Thank you, Glenn. So yeah. uh, does, can you tell us whether Teams has a feature wherein we can invite a group of people rather than inviting individuals separately? Well, it depends on your setup. So if you have a mail group, um, that could be used to do that. If you, you have uh, a group in your Active Directory, you can do that I'd like that, that, in that manner as well. It depends on the setup and exactly what you're trying to achieve. But yes, it is supported, just depends how you do it. Okay, excellent, thanks very much. Um, and do you know if this can link with Salesforce? Do you know, have you come across that? Do you know if we've been able to do that? Correct, you can, yeah. You can link it to Salesforce from the team's point of view, but then also uh, Chorus has a connector with Salesforce as well. So both of those options are available. And Dynamics. So you can connect both teams to Salesforce at Dynamics and you can do the same in Chorus. Okay, that's really good, very helpful. Thank you guys. Um, another question here, uh, speaking to you as consultants, do you find resistance amongst your clients? This is perhaps one for Olivia, perhaps. Uh, do you find resistance amongst your clients to using a Microsoft platform? Do they all have to have Microsoft accounts to participate? Um, this is from Mitch. He, f he feels that uh, Microsoft has done a poor job on things like mobile with Nokia and Skype. Um, and in, in his experience, he doesn't really know anyone who regards Microsoft as a first choice. So um, how does it work with your clients? We, we do find that a lot of clients really enjoy the familiarity of the Microsoft platform. Um, so, you know, they, you may be using Teams as your corporate collaboration tool. Um, it makes uh, it a good extension or platform to extend from uh, then to uh, use it for your bid and proposal teams as well or using a technology like Microsoft Word to respond to RFPs or Excel. Those are familiar applications that you know, many enterprise organizations use today. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that they really enjoy that Microsoft platform is because it's so familiar and because it's been used so extensively throughout the, their organizations. Okay. Olivia, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so I, I was going to say I, I, I can relate a little bit to that question because I, I'm a Mac and an Apple user. Um, but I must say that in the last, out of the last three, four years, it's been huge improvements in the, the Microsoft stack. It has become so much more intuitive and easy to use. Um, and Microsoft 365 and Teams are really changing the game and Skype is no longer pretty much. 
Um, so there's a lot of very cool stuff to check out on Microsoft 365. And as Ray was saying, because it's so widely utilized, it's got such broad adoption, it means you can work with everybody. So uh, there isn't a lot of resistance on my side that I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I can echo that being a Microsoft lover. Um, I'm biased in that way, but and I'm a SharePoint lover as well, but I can also see how natively SharePoint can be a little bit overwhelming for a lot of users. And so what Olivia has said, and so as Ray alluded to it, they've gone a long way to fix that or try to address it anyway. So Microsoft Teams is a great approach to making it a lot more easy to use. And I don't think anyone on this call even knew that SharePoint was behind Microsoft Teams. So they've done such a great job, you didn't know that. So um, it's extending all the time and they are making it easy to use and there's now support for, for Mac, you know, you can use Office apps for Mac now as well. So they are going a long way forward compared to what they used to be. So in my mind, the resistance is more legacy than anything else. I think if you looked at it from a fresh perspective today, you would, I think your opinion would change. Excellent. Right. Lovely. Um, quick question from, uh, let me find it now. So. Uh, Teresa asking, can you use Chorus with a content library on SharePoint? Yes, you can. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, just to just that up. Yeah, so just Excellent. to iterate a little bit further, so uh, within Chorus, you can connect to a SharePoint location. So your content library could just be in SharePoint. That's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. if if you create it in Teams, you can still connect to it using the SharePoint connector, or you can use the Teams connector. So you can do either within Chorus. Uh, it's your choice. You don't have to okay. use Teams or your content library at all. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, uh, Laura's got a, a slight concern here in relation to the Pursuits library. Suppose you create a channel for Company A and Company B. How do you keep people from Company A seeing the content for Company B, or vice versa? Security. Great question. So. You can add privacy to uh, the team that you create. So you can create your team as public or private. So that's the default for everything you do with it. So if you create it as private, every channel or for every pursuit is private until you make it otherwise. In other words, share it. If you make it public, that doesn't mean that everything is public. It just means as you create it, the channel for the pursuit is public until you lock it down. All right. So you can change the channel to be private. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility behind Teams that wasn't there in the beginning, um, and it is now there. So you've got full control over that as well. Lovely, thank you very much. So what features of Teams and SharePoint does one need to buy, or, or does it work for all Microsoft licenses? Um, you look, it just depends. I mean, Ray, you might have a better understanding than I do. I, we, we use the, I think it's the E3 or the E5 uh, license, but you don't need to. There's various different mm -hmm. subscription levels. And all you need to make use of Teams is if you're if you have the Teams icon as, as visible as part of your subscription, you have Teams and SharePoint behind the scenes anyway. So, and if you just have SharePoint, I don't believe you can have SharePoint without Teams anymore. So I think you have them both. Yeah, that's right, Glenn. And just to add to that, Microsoft actually offers a free version of Microsoft Teams now, um, which is incredibly powerful. It has uh, a lot of the uh, the enterprise level features in there. So. Um, I think everything that Glenn showed today uh, and a lot more is available with the free version of Microsoft Teams. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been a very popular topic. I'm working through the questions here, but no, no, no end of the questions is yet in sight. So bear with me while I ask you a few more questions. So do you have any good advice uh, when using Teams to keep people communicating through team posts instead of continually returning to e-messages? Any advice on that? Well, my advice, and everyone can have their own opinion, is <clears throat> stop replying outside of Teams. <laughs> <laughs> once you get used, to, it's the thing is once you get used to something, you don't go back. I mean, the Teams chats are are so much are far superior to emails. You know, it's so easy to lose an email. It's so difficult to find it once you don't have it in that right spot. Search is not great. Uh, the Teams uh, UI is so much better for that. If you if you've read something you want to unread it, mark it as unread, and it looks as a notification, it's a little, uh, little red indicator that you've got something to go back to. You can search. The search is far superior. You can filter by was it a meeting, was it a chat. You know, there's so many things you can do that are not as uh, are far superior to Outlook. 
that if you give it the time and the effort, you won't go back. But it's like anything, people don't like change. So you kind of have to just kind of like funnel them in by stopping replying outside that medium. And can you give any advice to Florin on how to manage access rights to the library? Uh, within SharePoint or Teams? Uh, it doesn't specify, so I don't know if you want to respond. So within, within Teams, uh, what you can do is a little bit less um, powerful than what you can do in SharePoint. So it depends on what the question actually is, but I'll explain both. So within Teams, what you can do is you can say that the team itself is private, um, and then you have to share that team or that channel with uh, the, your users, which then will share that folder, which is in the SharePoint library, actually, that's how it works. So that's how you do it within Teams. It's very light. You share it and you say, do you have read access? Do you have edit rights or do you have full control? Okay. SharePoint, you can take it a whole another level. Uh, it just depends if you want to do that or not. So I probably won't go into the SharePoint discussion now. You should be able to find a lot of that information in the guide we put together. Um, and there are other articles that we have in our help center that do talk about this. Um, but if you're just wanting to control who has visibility, who can edit and who has full control, you can do that through Teams. And it's very simple to do. You just share and you choose one of those three. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So um, a question from Bavia, how do we manage version control for standard responses for multiple lines of services and products? Have you come across that as an issue? Any suggestions? Okay, so um, perhaps I can take that one. So I manage a lot of proposal content. Um, one of the very powerful things with uh, with Teams and with um, SharePoint Online, which is kind of the underlying system, is you can set up your versioning settings. I think by default it retains 500 versions of your file, um, and so as you are working in Word or in Excel or in PowerPoint you can in fact go back and see the previous versions you can download them you can compare them you can see who who downloaded or who uh, created version 18 and who modified version 22 uh, so you can go back quite far and that's also one of the very compelling reasons to use uh, teams and sharepoint online for that sort of thing yeah Excellent. and just to extend that a little bit further you can also compare the different versions within Office. So if you're not entirely sure what those changes were, Office has got a great compare functionality between the different versions, which can help you to uh, just really understand what those changes were and if it's something that you want to make the, the live version. I had a couple of questions on the Citrix uh, network. Are there any challenges, problems, issues in working with that within the Chorus Teams programs? Does it work well? No, we have we have several customers using Citrix, um, and I don't believe there have been issues that I'm aware of uh, with that. So, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any issues with uh, that technology. Okay. And are there any issues with sharing a team site with an external company? Is there any challenges with that that need to be overcome? It depends on your security, IT security. So you can, it's not blocked unless your IT block it. So it really depends on your ecosystem and what your mm -hmm. IT team will allow or not allow. So it's not a blockage from Microsoft side, it'll be a blockage from your security if you can't do it, which you can change. Okay, uh, one of the questions from Vicky here is about the advantage of using Teams over a straight SharePoint collection site. You mentioned that SharePoint sits behind all this. What is it that Teams adds to that as far as you're concerned? It hides SharePoint. <laughs> um, experience. It, it just it makes it easier to use. If you all you all you're doing within SharePoint is creating folders and files, it's 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 cleaner to do it in Teams. If you're doing anything more advanced, it's, it's easier to do in SharePoint. But what Team adds to that space is collaboration. You can chat. You have meetings. You know you can, as I say, create a planner with different different swim lanes for work to do. So it, it adds all this additional functionality over and above. Right? You, if you don't like Teams or it's too simple for your use case, you can live in SharePoint. Whatever you do in SharePoint is available for the rest of the team in Teams. Um, so it, it depends on your use case, which one you want to live in. You don't have to live in one or the other. You can live in both. All right, very good. Thank you. Anything to add to that, anybody? Good. Okay, so if you connect uh, a, a separate, this is from Laura. 
if you connect a separate pre-existing SharePoint site to your team site, is there a way to prevent people from accidentally deleting the external SharePoint site within Teams? I don't know if I'm sensing some pain here from Laura, um, and she's had bitter experience of this, but if you've got any advice, I'm sure it'd be appreciated. Yeah, so the only person that can delete a team is the full control owner of that team. So just be mindful of that. If you've got full control, you have delete rights, and therefore the underlying SharePoint site can be deleted as well. But that shouldn't scare you because because there is a, Microsoft has a recycle bin. Yours, you would log a ticket with your support, they would log a ticket with Microsoft, and within hours it would be restored. It is not lost. And every file and folder within Teams and SharePoint also goes to a recycle bin, which you can access yourself. So nothing that you do within SharePoint or Teams can actually be lost. Uh, you can always have it restored. Okay, good. we've had a couple of questions. Of course, Thank you, Glenn. Sorry, say again? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and of course, if you, if you lock down the permissions correctly, you avoid the whole complication to begin with. Excellent, good to know, thank you. So, uh, we've had a couple of questions in relation to Planner, or Glenn, you reference Planner when you, you go through your presentation. Uh, we had one, one uh, opinion expressed, planning, Planner has many limitations in regards to the project planning. Um, and another question in relation to the planner asking, does it synchronize with team members' Outlook calendars? So, do you have any suggestions of an alternative to the planner, or and do you know if it does sync with the Outlook calendars for team members? Well, so because Teams is part of, sorry, Planner is part of the Microsoft stack, it is fully integrated with all Microsoft technology. So, yes, it does. Uh, now, in terms of it being as powerful as, say, Microsoft Project, no, it's not. It's a different pro product altogether. It's supposed to be lighter and easier to use. There are competitors out there, which I think Olivia would know better than I do about them, like I think Slack's one of them and some others, that may take you further to that uh, use case and should, and some of them are already apps that you can connect and add to Teams as well. Okay, thank you. Olivia, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, there, Glenn is right in saying that there are a lot of apps out there. Um, I've just been doing some own, my own shopping around for some project management software. Um, there are a lot of apps as uh, Asana, Teamwork, um, Sistema, yeah, the list is endless. So um, I think give them a try and see which works best for you. Yeah, Excellent. and a lot of them are apps you can add within Teams too. So mm -hmm. um, I know Asana is for sure, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure Slack is as well. Yes, I think I've come across Slack myself. So um, one quick question from Navisha here. It appears that when you chat in Teams, everyone receives an email as well. How do you prevent emails that come from the chats? That's to do with your notification settings. So you need to choose, um, and it's, it also differs based on if you create a team or your members. There's different there's different out the box functionality depending on how you add it to that team. But you can override all of them by changing your notification settings. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, I think a lot of this is is diving a bit deeper into some of the capability and some of the settings on a lot of the programs helps you to navigate some of these issues. So I appreciate your help with this, guys. Um, I've got a question from Tara asking about the difference between 365 and SharePoint. Um, she uses 365 but not SharePoint and it seems to cause restrictions on some of the apps. I don't know if she means the Teams app or some other apps within the system, but um, do you know anything about that, Glenn? Or? So it could be that uh, SharePoint's not part of her Office 365 subscription. That could be sure. something that she might be alluding to. Uh, but if she has Teams as part of her Office 365 subscription, then she does have SharePoint. It's just behind the scenes in Teams, which the guide will, the guide that's uh, with this webinar should show you how to get to. So I'm not too sure if that answers her question because it is a little bit ambiguous. Um, but yeah, SharePoint yeah. is an application within Office 365. And then maybe okay. just to chime in there, um, you know. Microsoft's Office 365 licensing has a range of complexity, but almost by default with every license, you get a OneDrive for Business uh, option, which is also cloud-based storage, which again could be used uh, for both the pursuits type library and the content library. It's, it's the most basic version. And then you build off that with Microsoft Teams or Microsoft SharePoint for a more advanced uh, experience. Um, but depending on your 
Office 365 license or Microsoft 365 license, you may have different ones of those capabilities available, or your tech team uh, inside your organization may have rolled different things out at various points. Okay, right. that's really helpful. So, um, a quick question here from, just trying to see the name on this. Um, oh, it's from Mark. Uh, he was asking about, is there any, any particular difference in uh, setting up a content library in Teams as opposed to SharePoint in, in regard to inviting users? Is, it, is there any difference in how you'd set them up in that way? Any advantages to the Teams way? So you cut out, you cut out a little bit with the question around sharing. That's well, fine. That, uh, was the question just around it, adding? It, about setting up a content library in Teams, how does it differ from setting up one in SharePoint? Uh, and in, in particular, in, relating, in relation to inviting users? So setting up the library in SharePoint, you have more ability to control what who you share with and, and what level of uh, permissions you're going to give them. Within Teams, it's very high level. Um, and it's usually to read, edit, and full control. Uh, in terms of setting up the library, um, again, Teams is more simplified, so you can create folders and you can add files. In SharePoint, you can add columns for metadata. You can't do that through the Teams interface. So it depends on what you're trying to do. So again, if you have Teams, there is SharePoint under the hood. If you want to do th something more complicated than you can do through the Teams user interface, you can do it through SharePoint. Um, it's this files are still in SharePoint, which are surfaced in Teams. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, managing, oh no, we've done that question. I do beg your pardon. Would you recommend using the wiki tool and the app for creating content libraries? Have you any experience on that? I haven't. I don't know if any of you yeah, have. It's not something, not something I've, I've come across. I have seen that used in the past, that wiki, that wiki app. Um, it's certainly a, a, a possibility. You know, where I've seen it used is less about storing reusable content and more storing uh, general instructions or keeping, um, you know, overall notes on on bid process um, and allowing the teams that collaborate to use that wiki to to find kind of the the policies for the team or the way that the team operates. So more of a operational manual than an actual reusable content piece. Uh, have you found the same, Olivia? Absolutely. Um, I, I typically use the wiki tab. Um, it gets populated by default as the place to go and put in all the clarification questions when we receive a bid, as we collaborate in a, in a channel around that bid. Um, also all the contracts, attachments, um, all the notes really, and a lot of interactive discussion happens around it so it's a it's very useful in that way but not so much for content libraries i'd say okay well i think we've covered most of the, the topics uh, that have been raised in the questions we've covered most of the points if we didn't get to everything um there's one or two there that i think stray slightly off topic a little bit um there is a few encouraging comments about this so one or two people have experienced planner and feel that they it's it's a great kanban tool i'm not quite sure what that means it works well for those such as those who've adopted sprints and other Scrum Agile tools. Um, and that particular member, Richard, also uses Trello, and that links into Team 2. So I don't know if you've experienced some of that yourself. Um, I, I really appreciate your time today, guys. Um, I'd like to thank um, our sponsors, Chorus, very, very much for being one of APMP's valued sponsor webinar organizers and for presenting such great content today and for being so patient and helpful with all these questions. I think you've touched a nerve for a lot of people and you've probably demystified a lot about teams um, that I'm sure a lot of people will take advantage of. Um, to the attendees, I'd like to say, please respond to our very quick survey about the webinar. Uh, we do read your feedback and it does help us plan future webinars in our program. And remember, you will get a link to the recording as well as a survey in just a couple of hours. So I'd like to thank Chorus for hosting the webinar. I'd like to thank, to thank all of you for joining us, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.